Welcome back to Special Effects in a Time of Quarantine. Tonight, today, this evening, we are looking at monofilament rigging and ropes. So, let's get the bit, the most important bit out of the way. Anytime you lift anything up off the ground, there is a danger it's going to come back down again in a way that you did not foresee. A uh, classic example is your brother-in-law gives you his old climbing harness and you think, I can hang somebody from the ceiling now. No, you can't. Anytime you're going to lift people, or again, as I say, lift anything over anybody's head, even a small thing, use professionals. Uh, you can hire them quite, well, I was about to say inexpensively, fairly expensively, but there's a reason for that. They have insurance. I once did a commercial using Michael Jordan as its star, um, and we, not me personally, the riggers, had to hang him by his ankles upside down. There was a line of lawyers out the door waiting for something to happen. So don't be that person. So safety first, second and third in all things lifting. So with no further ado, let's go do it. Welcome back. And first things first, I am not a professional rigger, nor do I play one on television. So regard everything I say with a grain of salt. Um, check it. Check it twice. Get a professional. Do not hang people from the ceiling. Do not hang yourself from the ceiling, even if you're wearing a little harness. It's a game for, for, for professionals, not for amateurs. And on that note, before we go any further, um, I mentioned in the beginning that a lot of this hardware is rated. So for, for example, this is an eye bolt, but you can see the eye is not continuous. It is not connected. Um, if you put a lot of weight on this, it will open up and become a J, J bolt, and then it will become nothing at all. If you're going to be hanging somebody, you would need a forged eye bolt like this. Um, this came from a master car, probably cost 20 times more than this did. Um, it has a safe working load limit on it. It has a manufacturer's mark, it has a date, all kinds of stuff. For example, also this carabiner, nice and shiny. No markings of any kind. Could be made out of pot metal for all I know. This much smaller carabiner has written on it SWL, which stands for safe working load, of 1,760 pounds. So it's likely that the breaking point of this, when it's correctly tightened up, is some five to 10 times more than that 1,700 pounds. The 1,700 pounds is what you can rely on. So bear that in mind. Uh, say example, this cheap carabiner, it's fine for holding down a tent, but no markings of any kind on it. Um, and if it did have markings, it would probably say not for lifting. So always look at your hardware. This, for example, says a quarter. That stands for a quarter of a ton. This shackle. Uh, it says SWL, safe working load, three quarters of a ton. It's small, but it's mighty because it's well made and expensive. So anyway, wire rope. Why do we use wire rope? Because it takes a huge amount of strain. This is 3 16th wire rope. It has a breaking strain of about 4,200 pounds. So the safe working load of under 1,000, but maybe 800 pounds will be safe. So if you didn't mind the car falling, you could lift a car with this. But there's a very good chance it might get to the breaking point, and if you were underneath the car, you would die. So be very aware of safe working load. It's quite a different matter from fishing, where you say it's a 10 pound test. That means we tested it and it breaks at 10 pounds. That's not the safe working load. That's the unsafe working load. The safe working load for a 10 pound test monofilament is probably two or three pounds but we'll get back to monofilament later. Let's stick with rigging and ropes, wire ropes. As I say, these are called uh, wire ropes or aircraft cable. It's confusing because they used to be used to hold up the wings of biplanes back when biplanes were made out of uh, fabric and dope um, and they were strung together with very thin, very tight aircraft cable. So it's still called aircraft cable. Types of aircraft cable. Uh, obviously, if you had a solid, a solid piece of, this is 3 16ths. If you had a solid piece of 3 16ths rod, 
it wouldn't bend. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to do this with it or wrap it around things or coil it up. So that'd be very inconvenient. If you had, if you divide this 3 16 into seven pieces, you end up with what's called one by seven cable, meaning there are seven strands and they're wrapped like that. The next stage, the most common, you'll see is seven by seven. So it's seven strands, each made up of seven wires wrapped together in a spiral. Next after that is 7 by 19 which is much more flexible because the wires are getting thinner so they slip more easily against each other and are easier to bend. So if you have something going around a pulley or a shiv, um, you, would use, you, you would want to use um, a cable with more finer wires in it. So this has 7 strands again but each has 19 wires in it which is a lot of small strands. It also means that you can lose a few of those strands through wear or getting nicked and the cable won't fail because it's got hundreds of these things, not quite hundreds, well yes, hundreds of tiny little wires in there, all wrapped together, and no single one of them is always in the same place on the outside to get worn away. So that's why we use um, wire rope. You can also get wire rope in extremely small um, diameters. This is a seven, one by seven. This is seven wires wound together. This is for fishing. This is for fishing some fairly large, bitey kind of fish who might be able to bite through monofilament. Um, but a good place to get stuff is a bait and tackle shop. So, we're going to want to cut said cable, um, and it's very difficult to cut wire rope, aircraft cable. Uh, one way of doing it is to use bolt cutters. But before you do, wrap tape around it, because when these things spring apart, all those little wires, they don't go back together again. And the important thing is that you have sharper bolt croppers than I do. Because I'm now minching, munching my way through individual cables. There we go. Um, because the cables are pretty small, so the teeth need, need to meet perfectly. But that's pretty good, and it's all stuck together. It hasn't splayed out like this one which when you get to this stage, you want to just cut it off again because these are the seven strands, each of which has 19 wires in it. And there ain't no way in God's green earth you're going to get that lot to go back together into something nice. It's always going to end up like there. So whenever you cut this stuff, wrap it first. You can use sh heat shrink um, insulation. You can use regular electrical tape. Um, I've even seen people, seen people use solder and then cut it. If you use solder, you can cut it with a Dremel cut-off tool or an or a angle grinder with a cut-off tool. The other way to cut cable is to do the right thing and use cable cutters. These are both sets of cable cutters that have been destroyed by people who worked for me who used them to cut nails, pieces of wire. Uh, these, these were, were, only to be used for cable cutting. They now, now no longer work. Let me demonstrate. This is what happens when you let people... See, it's all jammed in there because the teeth have been bent. And you can eventually get it apart because it will give way. Well, we'll do that later. Anyway, so if you do have cable cutters, mark on them for cable only. Otherwise, you will lose them. These, these don't cut anything anymore. Neither pair. I've got some nicer ones, but they're with my other tools. So, we've cut our wire to length, or a little bit extra. We want to wrap it around something so we can guy something down or pull, drag something along. Two ways of doing this. The best way is to use a swaging tool, which looks like one of these. Mine's in the shop currently. Um, looks like one of those. But what it does, it squashes a slug of either aluminum or copper onto the two, two parts of the wire and squeezing them nice and tight together, you get an incredibly strong bond. This should actually have another one here. This tail should be longer and there should be a second one on here. Um, but if there was and it was done correctly, you'd get about 90% of the original strength, which is very, very useful. Second thing you need to remember when you're doing this is you need to use a thimble because if we do this 
let's say this is an I-beam, we're hanging the cable over an I-beam, what's going to happen is the wire rope is going to kink here. And it's gonna, that's where it's gonna, the fail point's going to be. It's also going to be where all the friction's going to happen. So what you do, you do what has not been done here. You put what's called a thimble. I can get this one in. Yes, I can. It's just a protector which allows whatever you are hooking it onto to take the strain rather than the cable itself. Second way of attaching a thimble to wire rope, this is eighth inch wire rope, is to use these which are called wire clips. Brand name is Crosby. So these are Crosby's. And you can see it's got a thimble on it already. And you should use three of these ideally for this kind of size rope. Uh, not as strong because you're kind of squashing the cable a little bit, but quite, quite adequate in most situations. Interesting point about Crosby's. So this is, this is half the Crosby. It's got a U-bolt part that goes on, then you put the nuts on here. When you put these together, this part is called the saddle. And it's quite important that the saddle goes on the right side of the wire. Because this, let's say there's a load attached to this end, this is the live end of the wire. This little tail is the dead end. It's not taking, this bit here is taking no load whatsoever. The load is being taken by these three and by the thimble. So this is the live side, the bottom side. The top side is the dead side. When you saddle one of these up, partner, you saddle it with the live side going into the saddle. So the expression is never saddle a dead horse, to try and remember that. This is the dead side. That's the side that the U-bolt goes on because we don't care whether that bit gets a bit mashed, whereas the saddle is much broader um, and cupped, and so it won't damage the cable. So never saddle a dead horse if you're doing using wire clips. Again, these aren't as good as the swage, but they're convenient and you can take them off and adjust them. The swaging is a one-time deal. Once it's on there, it is done. So you've got two of these and you've attached them to something, but it's not quite tight enough. What shall we use? How about a turnbuckle? Turnbuckle is a very useful piece of kit in that it allows you to put an adjustment point in anywhere you want. It's a left-handed, that's a left-handed thread. This is a right-handed thread. So when I hold it and turn, you can see the gap in the middle getting smaller, it pulls them together until they meet. They come in every size. These are, does not say, they are not rated, so they're not quality. Uh, this is even lighter duty. And even lighter duty. This is just an, an aluminum extrusion. This would be very, very, for holding up a wooden fence or something. Again, don't use any equipment, any equipment that doesn't have safe working load stamped into it. Otherwise, you may come to regret it and your insurance company will not cover you. Shazam! As I mentioned earlier, you can buy aircraft cable in very small diameters. This is 1.012. So this is just over one hundredth of an inch thick. And it'll breaking strain is about 34 pounds. Um, it'll also cut you because this is the kind of stuff that James Bond pulls out of his watch and garrots somebody in the bathroom, or maybe somebody does it to him. But this is the kind of stuff they would use. 34 pounds on this is, makes a great cheese slicer. Um, you can also get um, thimbles to match this kind of size. That's That tiny little thing there is a swage. Um, much like the larger one. Like that. A much smaller version of that. You can also, um, there's a bunch of stuff in the tackle world for connecting small wire rope together, small aircraft cable. Um, these from Berkeley come with a little tool. It's not a great strength thing, but for, um, for lifting simple objects, it's, it's going to give, uh, I'm going to 
obviously cut myself if I try and pull that anymore. But you get the idea. Um, and again, bait shops, uh, a good bait shop will have a large selection of the, of, um, the fittings to go with this. Brake cables are next. So uh, using brake cables that slide within a sleeve, like this one, very handy for remote action, um, triggering any number of effects, controlling puppets. Um, you're probably familiar with how, how this works on a regular bicycle. It's a cable within a sleeve. This one doesn't have a sleeve, but I'm sure you're familiar. The sleeve goes over the outside, and then when you pull the lever, the sleeve stays still. This is the important part. The sleeve needs to be isolated and held down. So one end of it butts up against the brake lever, and this pulls against it, and the outer sheath stays where it is, and the inner cable does the moving. Generally, these work only in one direction. That's why the brake at the other end has a very, very tight spring on it. So it pulls back against this outer sheath and allows this end to go backwards and forwards. So you need a spring at the other end. Or you can use what's called a control cable. This is basically the same thing, but it has a solid, this is solid wire. So you can push it and pull it. These were most often familiar to people from, um, this, I think, believe it, this actually came out of a vehicle. I think this is an old fashioned manual choke cable. But quite useful because you get positive control in both directions without a spring. You can't push too hard, but you can do a small amount of jiggery poker. But more often than not, um, using brake cable, especially over long distances, you have a spring on one end um, and the action is thus. If you want a little bit more control, let's say you are puppeteering something, you can get um, a controller like this, which gives you a lot of very fine control to, be, to emote, perhaps, if you were doing puppeteering, or to apply large amounts of force very rapidly. And again, the sleeve, the sleeve would go on here and goes all the way, pretty much all the way to your effect where it stops, is terminated and isolated so that it can't move. Again, so the outer sleeve st always stays still. Look at your bike next time you're getting it on, getting on it, and look at how the brakes and the gear change work. How there are sections of bare wire and then sections of sheath which are attached to the bicycle. Um, so they don't move ever. Um, you can, um, these little bits on the end, well, well, here we go. all this is available. You can buy the individual parts on the internet. The little bit on the end is called a ferrule and you can buy cable in bulk with these attached to either end, but that's not very useful because you don't know how long it needs to be, and it'd be but it's nice to have them. So you can buy, these are three different kinds of ferrules. One is a screw on one, this one. This one in the middle is a swage. You give it a squeeze and it becomes a little blob like this. And this one's got an Allen key set screw in it. So you can tighten it down. Kind of mangles the wire a little bit. Um, there are probably other kinds. But having a ferrule on the end allows you to take advantage of the high speed nature of bicycle. There, we're attached. No other work to do. So extremely useful. Um, all of this is available in bulk. You can buy the outside cable in various diameters. You can buy the inside cable in various, various diameters. You can buy all the little hardware bits quite inexpensively. And then you can sit back in your deck chair and control any number of things from a distance smoothly and reliably. To ropes. That's where we were going next. So quick question. What is the difference between these two? One of them is a different color and is slightly larger. But that's not the only difference. The real difference is that this has a safe working load of under 100 pounds, probably 75. This is more like 1,000 pounds. So don't judge books by their cover, especially when they're ropes. Because this came from a big box retailer. I'm not going to say who, but they're all their stuff is all the same. And it cost me maybe, oh, I had a receipt somewhere. It was. 10 bucks for 50 feet 
of this. And it seems like it's been filled with old cigarette butts or paper towels. Um, it is junky, junky, nasty rope. Um, one way you can tell that is it's possible to... <laughs> I didn't think I was going to do this. That is not a rope you want your life or anybody else's relying on. So be careful what you buy. This is junk and say it cost $10 for 50 feet and I probably got overcharged. This was probably twice that price, maybe 40 cents a foot. This is made by a real rope company. They put their brand on it. It is not, however, climbing rope. Um, climbing rope doesn't always look like this. It often, it often tends to look like this. This is what quality rope people decided it looked like. So the cheap rope just started making their rope to look like that, which is unfortunate. So this is actually nice climbing rope. Uh, it might be an old, old black diamond rope from a long time ago. Um, I don't use it for climbing because I don't climb. But it's a good place to get old ropes, it's from climbers. But if you are going to be suspending somebody, which you're not because you're not qualified, you would use climbing rope, which is expensive. So again, for example, this is, this probably cost me a dollar a foot. Um, it's got Kevlar inside of it. Um, it's very stiff. You wouldn't want to run this through a pulley but it'll take many, many thousands of pounds before it gives way, even though it's much smaller than this stuff. So, cost versus quality. Buy what you can afford. Buy nice stuff, buy brand names. Don't buy from Amazon just made in China climbing rope. Uh, literally, your life may depend on it, or somebody else's. So, what about knots? Are you not going to tell us how to tie knots? Look. Get yourself one of these, knot guide, or proper care and use of rope. Comes with descriptions of knots in many languages. There are excellent guides online. They animate and show you how to tie a knot. But there are effectively three knots that you need to know. Um, very basic. This is a, called a reef knot or a square knot or an overhand knot. Um, what's good about it? is it's very easy to do. It's very easy to tell if you do it wrong. It becomes a granny knot. It looks very ugly. It will allow you to tie together two pieces of rope which aren't exactly the same thickness. Some knots will not be able to do that. Another a nice advantage of this is no matter how tight it has been, you can do this and it comes apart. The problem is, if you leave it and you're not paying attention, it comes apart. So there's a plus and minus to that, the reef knot. Um, this is the king of knots, the bowline or bowline. Uh, if you can tie this knot reliably every time in different situations, tying it from one end rather than the other end with a big loop, with a small loop, with no loop, um, you will be the king of knots. And the nice thing about it, it looks kind of like a tie. It looks right when you do it right. The same thing with a lot of knots. There's an order to them that you can see immediately whether you did it the right way. Um, this is the one where there's a, you make a loop in the rope and the top of the, the loop is the tree. The rabbit comes up, the rabbit being the loose end. The rabbit comes up through the hole, goes round the tree, goes back down the hole. That one. Um, and again, I'm not going to teach you how to do knots because that seems like the most pointless thing ever. Um, go online and do that. What I found useful when I was taking sailing lessons was to have a nice piece of rope. It was actually, I think, this piece of rope. It's very pleasing to have in your hand. It's an old main line from a sail, from a yacht. Um, it's very pleasing to have in your hands. And I would carry it around with me when I was bored, when I was in a dentist waiting room, I would practice knots. Um, and then I stopped practicing knots and I forgot them all. What can you do? The third knot, which you will use most likely in your career, if you spend any time around the movie business, is a trucker's hitch or a modified trucker's hitch for when you are in the back of a cube truck and they've given you a length of sash cord, this is cotton sash cord, um, fairly unpleasant stuff, suffers from the inability to not unroll. Um, Any time you're going to be cutting rope, let's talk about cutting rope for a moment. What you should do, if you're cutting cotton rope, 
Take a length of electrical tape, don't cut your fingers in the process, wrap it around. Doesn't have to be that long. Wrap it around so, and much like when we're cutting cable, cut in the middle of the tape. And you can use a pair of scissors for this. And then you end up with this. And now, it won't undo. There is an easier way, however. If you have rope which is plastique, which this is, uh, it won't work for the for my uh, super duper rope here because this has got Kevlar in the middle of it and Kevlar does not melt. It chars but it does not melt. But, if you warm up a knife, you can also use one of these, but I'm not going to because it wears it out or it destroys the blade. And this, you can see I've used before, this sits in my knife kit. So warm it up, get it nice and hot. And then simply chop the end off. And it will seal it at the same time as cutting it. It's a perfect thing. It doesn't smell so good. Oof. Okay, so that was cutting things. Uh, uh, yes, you're in the back of a cube truck and you have a length of sash cord and you have maybe a wardrobe you need to attach to the side walls and you've forgotten all your ratchet straps. The ideal thing to use here is a ratchet strap, but you've got this. So how are we going to tie a knot that's going to allow us to tighten something down? Let's cut to a close-up. Imagine, if you will, this is the side of a truck, upright. So let's say we want to attach this using the ubiquitous Every cube truck in America on a film set has a lot of this in the back of it. These are our two tie-off points. So, again, I'm not gonna, you're not going to learn how to do a, a trucker's hitch. Or this is a modified trucker's hitch. This is the low-quality version from watching me do this, but it's, you will find it very useful. So, first of all, you're gonna make, it's going to make a loop on the end of the rope so you can tie it to something. This might mean you... You're actually tying it through a rub rail, but all I've done is put a screw into the table, so that's what I've got. So what you do is you go to your second point, wherever that may be, and then somewhere in the middle, on the first line of rope, we're going to put another loop. Again, these are this is a simple overhand knot that ends up looking like that. So now we have one loop there, one loop here. And we continue. We go around our second point. And now we have the opportunity to use this loop as a pulley and gain some traction. You see how if I pull on this I can tighten up and I can make this much tighter than it was before. I can make it tight enough that I can break these screws, I expect. There we go. And now because I've got this bend in the rope here, I can hold it tight. This is still nice and tight. Because I'm using my fingers to bend the rope around a... Voila! A trucker's hitch. If you're not going very far and you feel confident, you can turn this into a quick release hitch by not pulling the end through. So again, get it nice and tight. Feed it through. But then don't let the end out. So it's more like a tying a bow in your shoes. So when you're ready to be done, bingo, it's free. And again, this is a modified trucker's hitch, so don't send any in, in any complaints. If you were going from coast to coast, you would not use this to hold down your load. This is for local moving of movie props, etc. Um, and again, look it up online and learn from them, not from me. Because I'm sure I'm getting it wrong. So next up, monofilament. Why would we want to use fishing line? Well, for one thing, it's really, really hard to see it when it's very small. This is two pound test monofilament. And you might be able to see that. You can probably see it in front of my sweatshirt. If you want to make it a little more invisible, we can give it the old Sharpie treatment. 
which may help us devisualize it. You can do the same thing to tungsten wire now. Now do you see it against my shirt? You see this bit. But anyway, this is two pound test monofilament and it will eventually break. But the trick with monofilament, especially super fine stuff like this, is not that it's breaking, it's tying knots in it. It is really hard to tie knots in. Um, if you're an expert fisherman, you will have got the hang of it. But most of the time, you're not tying knots in things that you can barely see yourself. So if you're in the corner of a stage and it's kind of dark and they're kind of calling for you to come up and do your thing, um, it can be quite annoying to have to try and try and tie this stuff off. So what most people do is what I did just then was use a small piece of tape. Use This is um, T-Rex tape, a cousin of the Gorilla tape, second cousin of Gaffer tape. Um, I used to like the Brontosaurus tape, but they discontinued that. Uh, so get some nice sticky, I mean, sticky is what we're after here. This stuff is very sticky. Get a nice clean bit, which again involves you possibly slicing your hands apart. And what we're going to do is, well, you might as well just imagine that I've got the, t the, what, the stuff in my hand because I can barely see it, is I'm going to draw it for you. It's probably easier. Here we go. This is the path. This is the path the tape, the monofilament will make on this tape. Does that make sense? And then you stick it to whatever you want to stick it to like that. And then the monofilament has to unwind itself, which it's never going to do. For two pound monofilament, I was using a piece of tape this big and it had dirty fingerprints on it. And it's still, the monofilament is still attached to it when it snapped. So you can use a tiny, tiny piece of monofilament of, of very sticky tape that you hide somewhere. So when you want something to be lighter than air and it floats across the stage, that's probably what you're going to be using. Obviously monofilament, that's two pound monofilament. You can get one pound, mono, one pound test monofilament, which means it will break at one pound, which it kind of does. Um, the one and two pound is the same diameter, so I'd use a two pound. It's 0 0.004. So four point zero zero four thousandths of an inch. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. Four thousandths of an inch or forty thousandths. I always get those get those confused. Um, and this for example is let's let's maybe use a black background so you can actually see what I'm talking about. This first one here is two pound monofilament. You can see this is black, this is un unsharpied. This is all unsharpied. This is six pound monofilament. This is 20 pound, again, with a little bit of darkness on or put on by the Sharpie there. And this is 30 pound test fishing line. These are all clear. They are not the, uh, you can get this stuff, which has a green tint to it. Um, this is spider line, I think. Yeah, spider line. Uh, it's your choice, but it's, it's better to start with a nice clear one. Um, and you may need to, as you can see, depending on what the background is, so you can see the, the, the dark line very clearly there and less clearly there. And the same with the, on the two pound, barely visible under the white, but then suddenly it becomes, oh, there it is. That's where I sharpied it. So you may need to put a little bit of Sharpie in, and you do it to camera. So I was talking about tungsten wire. Tungsten is a very strong metal, quite brittle, very hard, quite light for its strength. Um, I just measured a hair off my head, and I've got pretty thin hair, uh, and it was 0 0.0015. And you can, it's, it's in the jaws of this caliper. I don't know if you can, no, you're not, not going to be able to see that. Um, so you can buy tungsten wire, which is half as thick as that, 0 0.0005 of an inch um, and that'll hold about a pound and a half if you tie the ends off properly again one end will need to be probably be taped um, using some sticky tape um, the other end 
again use tape or super glue. You cannot tungsten wire in particular if you bend it it tends to get kinks in it and it snaps. Um, if you are tying monofilament, fine monofilament, two pound, four pound monofilament, an easy way to do it is just do the easiest, simplest knot you can and add just a tiny, tiny little bit of super glue to it and that'll bung it up nicely and give it as much strength as you need. What do you know about pulleys? What don't you know about pulleys? Well, we're about to find out. So I'm going to build a little gantry and we're going to work out how pulleys can help us by extending the range of a human power. So you can do the work of three people, it'll just take you three times as long. Well, I put that in a kind of an awkward level, didn't I? <clears throat> Maybe I have to talk a bit, be a bit taller. Anyway, so that's the gantry. This is going to be interesting. Hang on a second. Oh, that's better. If you were building the pyramids, for example, you might use pulleys to make your life easier or you just use thousands upon thousands of slaves. Anywhere you go. So, this is the first kind of pulley. This is, it takes probably 25 pounds to lift this 10 pound weight because there's no bearing here on this hook. So the first thing somebody smart did was say, let's give it a bearing. So this now, does not give us any mechanical advantage, but it merely allows us to lift something, something up in the air. I'm pulling with about probably 10 and a half pounds of force, 10 pound weight, and whatever friction there is in this moderate quality pulley. So I pull six inches, the weight goes up six inches. Nice, but not groundbreaking. The next thing is to add another pulley. Now we've added a pulley at the bottom and the rope terminates on the gantry. So now we have, assuming this is out of the picture, we have two falls. This is a fall. Anytime it goes from fixed point to a moving point, it's a fall. And this will tell us how much work we're getting out of this, how much mechanical advantage. Before we, were, we had one fall, just this one here. So it was one to one. We have one input, one output. Now, I have to move my hand twice as far, but I'm using half as much energy. So the end result is the same. It's a zero sum game. We're not actually winning anything, but it's a lot easier. I'm probably pulling six pounds and it's lifting a 10 pound weight. I'm just pulling this rope twice as far. So this is nice, but let's go one further. So now we've added another pulley here so the rope comes up instead of tying off here, it goes back down and ties off to our weight. So we have three falls. So if I move this rope six inches, it's going to move that rope, it's going to move the weight two inches. We're going to gain three times the effort. Three times less effort, three times the distance. So if you watch the relative speed of these, this one will move fastest, then this one, then this one. Quite amazing, we have one more pulley left. Back again, we now have four falls. So, for a total of four pulleys and four times the mechanical advantage. So, if this weighed 100 pounds, to me it would weigh 25 pounds. Obviously not taking into consideration friction. But it's very easy to pull up and down. These aren't great pulleys, but they don't have any bad ball bearings in them but they are good quality stamped rated pulleys. So obviously this works the other way too. If you wanted to pull something very rapidly, you could do this and attach an air cylinder instead of this weight. Pull this very rapidly and it's the principle of how ratchet pulls work when stuntmen get yanked uh, when there's an explosion. Something like this happens and you can see this final rope is moving extremely fast. Principle of how that works. So one quick thing about pulleys. You will see a lot of pulleys in a lot of places. And as I said, let me come through the window. This is a passably good pulley. Um, 
You can tell that because, not because it says China on it, but it tells you the maximum thickness of the rope you can use. It has a printed stamped name, um, a safe working lobe, which is 480 pounds. And what's very nice about this is you can pull out this pin and remove the wheel. You go, well, why do you want to do that? Well, let's say you've got a whole bunch of the pulleys and what have you, and you want to take one of them out. You don't have to have the end of the rope to feed it through. You can put the, this over the rope, do this, put the pin back in, and Bob is your brother-in-law, as they say. Um, talking of crappy pulleys, do not buy pulleys that look like this. Um, they sound as good as they are. Junk. This is just a brassy coloured piece of junk. Not rated, no label, um, no use of serviceable parts. Fine for a shopping, for a washing line, but that is a bad value. If you buy very nice pulleys, they come with bearings in. These are, this is a sailing pulley. Um, and technically, these are also known as shivs or sheaves because a shear would actually look like... I just got this back from D-Block, so... But that's what a shear looks like normally. But in the world of pulleys, this is a sheave. Up next. So to wrap up, most importantly, be very careful. If you are going to lift anything more than a ham sandwich above anybody's head, if at all possible, get professionals to do it. Just be aware that things that go up can come down unexpectedly. Secondly, don't judge a book by its cover, in particular with rope. What may look like, oh, this is climbing rope, may well not be climbing rope. You get what you pay for, pay a little more. Um, monofilament and fishing line. Go to Cabela's, Dick's Sporting Goods, Bass Pro Shops, or to your local bait and tackle shop, um, and you'll be amazed at the range of tiny hardware they have for attaching things to monofilament. Lastly, pulleys and the like. Spend as much money as you can. Uh, what you don't want to be left with is cruddy hardware because you'll have it for a long time. I've had these pulleys for eight, ten years, used them many times, I will use them many times again. So it's a good investment um, and it may allow you to sleep better at night. That's about all for mono, monofilament rigging and rope. Um, we'll be back shortly. So we are back for the bonus edition of Air Movers Group Project. Uh, this is the small one. I'm going to do a little bit of surgery on the baked bean can. I did try and use a can opener. Complete failure. The bottom is not cinched on, it's a one piece. You just can't cut it off with the kind of can opener I have. So we're gonna whack the lid off in a more dynamic way. Voila! Nice and sharp. Ooh, yes, baby. So we're going to deburr those because that's going to, that's just horrible. So anyway, we're going to make a little ring out of tubing about this size. I don't know how we're going to do that. Fill it full of sand, maybe a spring, put a spring inside of it. Then when you bend it, it won't, it won't do this. It won't kink. Um, then we'll drill holes in it and it'll be a little thing on a stand. On a, on a handle with a trigger, the air will go like that. Um, so this is point of use, um, smoke manipulation, draft induction. You'll be able to put it fairly close to something and be able to induce a draft of some kind. Second part, this thing. So for this, if you can come up with any suggestions about how I can, in addition to what I said, bend this tubing into a tight, tight, tight circle, without kinking it, oh, and how we attach it, and anything else you've got. 
So for this, the bigger version, I took somebody's advice, Elena, perhaps. Oh, this is only a 10 inch. Obviously too long. And somehow we are going to... It's heavy too. We're going to attach this on the inside through some careful skullduggery. We'll have to make a little notch for this. Um, and then somehow attach it. I don't know. I don't want to screw screws into it because it'll have holes in there. And it's not really structural. It's a piece of copper, copper pipe. So any suggestions on how we can attach this to the inside of this piece of ductwork and what we're gonna we're gonna aim for is something which is cone shaped so it's gonna have a little bit of angle of the dangle attached to it and we're gonna have to fill in this bit because we're only gonna make it this long so we'll have some spare we can use to scab over the bit where the dart is, if you are making a costume, it's going to look like that. Maybe even more exaggerated. So suggestions please, I will attempt to act upon those suggestions. Um, in the meantime, there is a quiz, it's a pretty simple quiz, and it'll be checking to whether you are paying attention during the lecture. Um, I will be talking to you um, starting at 10 o'clock at the times I told you earlier. I look forward to talking to you. Goodbye.